this is a self-portrait, obviously, <laughs> of me. Um, no, but uh, thank you guys again for, uh, it sounds like you guys meet pretty, pretty often, so for me to come back to, I mean, it, I, I'm honored to be in front of you guys because you guys are my peers. I've been coding Java for over 20 years now, and um, been in this game, and <laughs> you've seen the evolution of Spring, right? Who's all been there? <laughs> Uh, but you know, definitely came to really give you guys an insight, my view on on OAuth. Um, so, who here has actually heard of OAuth before? Who just loves OAuth? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> not many. But um, who's actually using OAuth today? Like any? Okay, I, there should be a few hands back here. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, definitely the evolution, and one of the you know just kind of big misconceptions is that. You know, OAuth, sometimes people think of that as an authentic authentication protocol, which it's not. It's, it's really just a way of, you know, being able to interact with um, all the different layers of, of an authentication flow or, or, or whatnot. But the evolution of it is going to be more OIDC. Um, so I'm really going to just kind of take you through the different stages of just learning about this from just kind of my, my point of view. You know, I definitely encourage everybody to read up more about this, the topic because, you know, as, as being in this space you know, as, a, as a career right now, I don't think that I know all the answers. Anybody that says that they know all the answers has probably <laughs> still got a lot to learn, in, in my opinion. Um, and this is definitely something that we can keep interactive. So if you do have questions or you just want to talk through something, by all means, just stop me. Um, yeah, and so again, Ryan Schaller, I love uh, basketball. For those that like basketball, I'll challenge anybody to a game. <laughs> I rarely lose on one-on-one, -on -one, but you know, maybe if you catch me inside or something, we go there. Um, so why OAuth? <laughs> I like Joey from Friends. He's like, why pineapple? Why OAuth? Um, you know, it's it's basically to ch to solve a, a pretty bad problem that was happening prior to to this, this invention, which was basically saying like, okay, when you want to go into a service or I want to go into Google or, or any of those those applications where the, which was first using OAuth, you'd have to type in your credentials. Well, that's basically just handing the keys to the kingdom to someone. It's saying, here are my username and password, and here's everything that uh, you, know, you would need to be able to impersonate me. So over time, um, Basically, they've evolved it, um, you know, traditional ways of doing this, and, and, and come up with more of an OAuth uh, standard. So OAuth, um, in its in its rare form, is really being, being able to say, you know, when I call a resource or when I want to hit something, um, you know, what context do you have about me as a user, or you know, what authentication? And I'm boiling, boiling in some OIDC concepts, so just kind of follow with me. Um, but basically, I want to be able to access some sort of web server or an API, something to the tune of, 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 of that. And um, within that, I need to be able to have kind of a, an ebb and flow. So being able to say, this is the resource that I request access to, and how do I get some sort of access to that? So you basically, you know, there's a, a number of different ways to do this. Um, but you know, generally speaking, doing OAuth flows and doing OIDC is, is a much better approach. So <laughs> who's here uh, gotten the screen before where it's Facebook or Google that says, I want to do it? And most people obviously use this OAuth to just get access to Farmville, <laughs> clearly. Um, but no, it is that information. It's saying. You know, how do I give access to a resource that I have protected, right, even if it's a game or if it's a web service? How do I perform that without actually passing my credentials? So OAuth is like more of a delegated auth authentication framework, um, very similar to um, you know, SAML 2.0. But, you know, look at SAML 2.0. That was built in 2005, or like basically that protocol was rolled out in 2005. So it's... You know, it has a lot of limitations. One of the, you know, the biggest ones is that, you know, I'm limited to at least a web browser flow. What if I wanted to do things more client ID, client secret? You know, the t television, how do I authenticate that, right? It's not like I can always log in a browser. I mean, smart TVs have, have evolved, but, you know, even server to server, machine to machine, how do I actually grant access to a set of APIs to another service to be able to communicate? Um, so you don't always have that SAML flow 
And then, you know, contextually, you know, just from a security standpoint, you know, JWT also has that same protection with, uh, if you guys, have you guys heard of JWT before or JWT tokens? So yeah, JWT, we'll go into that a little bit more, but, you know, it's a way to be able to sign the requests that are going back and forth so that the tokens that you do get when accessing a resource or needed to access a resource is also secure. So it may seem a little bit scary at first, but you know, don't necessarily get bogged down with those details. And before I continue, any questions so far? <coughs> yes? Are you going to be talking about OAuth or OAuth 2? Very good question. So OAuth 2.0, more, more so, because there are the two different versions, which is OAuth 1.0 OAuth and OAuth 2. But those are not actually backwards compatible. So you don't want to typically focus more on OAuth 1.0. Try to trend yourself more towards the OAuth, OAuth 2.0 framework. I'm going to say that at least a dozen times tonight. So another question. Oh, uh, now, what group of standards bodies responsible for OAuth? Say that again? What group of standards bodies responsible for OAuth? Which group are standards? <coughs> Body? Hmm, I'm not sure I understand the question, sorry. <laughs> well, who defines the standard for OAuth? Oh, who, it's, um, you know, I forget who's like the actual standard standard, but I do know that OAuth.com is something that, I'm not trying to plug Okta, but that's something that we actually own. You own that, 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 that web resource. I don't know the specifics of who defines the standard. You'll have to excuse me on that. Okay. Um, but um, basically, with that, trend is, you know, we want to be able to say, like, what are the defining concepts when it comes to OAuth? How do I interact with this appropriately? Um, the other big thing, too, is really just saying, okay, so if I'm going to make a request to a server, on, and, and I want to be able to give that server or that user some, some context for that token, you know, what do I need to be able to do? So, you know, all often APIs, like this is like some of the key takeaways that I would say are, are super important. You know, also that token is restricted to only access what the user authorized for the specific app. So, have you guys been to a hotel before and I give you a hotel key? Well, that hotel key is good for a specific room or a specific service for that hotel. So, it's not like it's, you know, I get to go into someone else's room that, that that's, that's out of, out of scope. Um, but being able to provide, you know, context for that user once they get, get that token um, is really the important, important part of, of, of this. And so, you know, over, over time, you'll, you'll, as you start to play more and more with the OIDC framework and, and, open, I, and open Identity Connect um, implementations, you can provide what's known as scopes. So who's heard of scopes before? So scopes are like the way of basically bundling on all the permissions that would be contextual to a user. So I'm going back to a hotel model. I'm Ryan Schaller. Within my token are all the different scopes that I have been granted as a user. So it says Ryan gets hotel room access. I also get spa treatment access. I also get um, you know just the basic amenities. But those scopes and permissions are given to me as an individual that then I can go back to it. So. If you take this comparison to more of the API world, I say, I want to access like a get users. So I want to make a call to a REST API endpoint called get users. Well, in order to do that, I need to be able to have some sort of context. So before, you would have to go back and say, after you've authenticated, then also get some sort of context around who I am as a user. Um, you try to bring all of that together as, as, as just one single entity with the token. So then I hit that get user endpoint, and then I have specific scopes or permissions that are associated with me as an individual. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Cool. Actually, I have a question. Sure. <coughs> so the auth in OAuth, is that for authorization or authentication? Yeah, more authorization, yeah. So it's like basically defining like the standard on, way, on the ways to do implementations of this. There's no like, oh, you know, hey, who's the context of the user? That, that, that typically has been missing, which is why OIDC, like Open Identity Connect, actually combines all of that information and saying, you know, give me auth authentication and authorization, specifically because people went down that flow of saying, why can't I just make OAuth just work this way? Does that make sense? 
Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> But, you know, if you break down OAuth into kind of central components, right, you have scopes and context of, of that user or consent, right, similar to that Facebook-style <coughs> authorization or, 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 or flow that you would say, um, you know, do I have give consent to allow my contact <coughs> information to be accessible? Or, you know, what permissions am I granting to said service or, or um, you know, what permissions do I get context-wise for accessing an API endpoint. Um, but, you know, simply put, you know, these are just the, some of the, like, the high-level components that you would have to consider when you're working with the OAuth framework. Um, but it's also very useful to just be, you know, familiar with, you know, kind of just the overall flow of this. So you have, typically would have, you know, the different types of um, environments where you either have public or client identifications or more confidential client authorizations, which is more like behind the scenes. So there's two different contexts. There's like that front end and then the back end. So your front end, you don't want to be revealing your like client IDs and client secrets to the users, or not sorry, not client IDs, but like client secrets to the users, you would be able to make all that authorization from the back end to be able to say, get a token on behalf of this user and then just ship it back. Um, but you know, general flow would look like I, as a Ryan Schaller, want to access API <laughs> RS. I'm trying to access a resource server you know, that might be serving up at, you know, again, slash get users. And then after I try to get that, it's going to immediately delegate me to say, like, go back and get, get an actual token from an authorization server. And then issue that back to the resource owner, whoever is going to be the actor in this play. So it's just then down to that resource server. So I, you know, you'd see this by me entering my credentials in on a web web page, or you guys have seen this when you open up your phone and you just off into like your bank. I'm typically issuing you a token, and then that token is good for you know accessing resources appropriately. And so within that token, and this is kind of like a little bit mixed mixed up uh, examples, but basically within that token is then those scopes and permissions that are just shoved in. Make sense? Cool. Seems like you're missing the arrow. Yeah, <laughs> as far as the diagram goes, well, there's no contact in the diagram between the <coughs> server and the authorization server. So, no. So, it's implicit flow without that. Correct, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. I am highlighting more of an implicit flow. And the other thing to, to also just to note, so this is, yeah, right, implicit flow. Um, but, you know, when you're getting a client ID, a client secret style flow, I'm, I'm also trusting you as a user to keep that very sacred. You're not going to be using this for more, like, behind the scenes, or not, not more front end uh, use cases like spa. You're keeping that information very sacred. So handling that client ID, client secret, like it's like the keys to the kingdom, is the way that you should approach that. So, you know, basically, you know, before OAuth comes out, you know, so OAuth comes out and then I have to typically hit this slash me interest uh, endpoint for, you know, Facebook when they first came out with this, they, they released it and then they said, okay, you know, at least let me give you some, some information about that profile information for that user. So I go slash me and then I get all the user info that I would need. Again, there, there's a reason why you moved more towards OIDC framework is to be able to have some standard approaches on how you're consuming that information. So, Ryan, can you go back to sure. who's, who's asking the user for this rich body of personal information? Yeah. So, and that, the, the person asking for it, so like say I'm a company X, and I'm asking you to log into my service or, you know, again, that Facebook style, you know, I'm, I'm Farmville and I've created a game. I want to ask you for certain information that I need to be able to either, you know, you'll see this in like a Bejeweled or, or any of those kind of gaming scenarios where I can either post on behalf of you. I'm asking for your consent 
Um, so the, act, the actor or the person requesting this is, is just like the company who, who is asking for this. But it can be serviced in just like even providing a, a web page to somebody. So it can be, you know, an authorization portion. But is yeah, that I'm just trying to find some context here. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm a business and I have an employees, there's going to be an employee registration process mm -hmm. for onboarding the employee. Yeah. And HR is involved and everybody else to make sure Bob is Bob. Right. Okay. This right. is not that context. Right, no, that's like more of a user registration flow more so than anything. This is more of already, you already have your credentials, you're like your username and password to log into a website, or you already had like a, um, a client ID or client secret that was issued to you. But somebody's managing that registration information, that personal information. That is correct. So you typically have to have that stored wherever the authorization <coughs> server is. Mm -hmm. And so that authorization server is talking to some sort of back-end database. In the game, in the game example, it's like it's mm -hmm. Facebook, right? Yeah. Right. So Facebook would have... They have that information. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I read a lot of stuff. But I was reading that hack with us, so the millions of people are so yeah. Facebook. Facebook is the fun. Pretending to be you. Yeah. They, they hacked into that. No, and that's what happened, right? Is that, you know, basically I could use that user impersonation maliciously. Right. So they didn't implement OIDC and, and OAuth correctly because they were allowing people to. I didn't read into how they hacked. Yeah. But you're saying they did not implement it correctly. Yeah, that, that, that's what it came down to is that they allowed people to then take that token. Right. You know, from that viewpoint of, you know, impersonating a user. So if I impersonate Christian, all of a sudden I can basically relay that token to those other services. So mm -hmm. if you do that poorly, then all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, I've gotten way more information than I should have been given in the first place. Does that make sense? Cool. But, you know, so to just kind of take go with me here with, with all of this is that, that, you know, from an OAuth perspective, you know, it's, it's missing the idea of having some context around that information. The people who are asking for that context are typically like a service like a Facebook or if you're a SaaS service like us, like it's it's basically all your API endpoints. I need to be able to have some sort of trust between you as a requester of, of the services that I provide and then um, the, the, the trust after, after that exchange has, has happened, you give me your credentials or um, you know what have you, you go through some sort of OIDC flow to be able to then say, okay, do you want to grant me access to to your existing user repository, which could be Facebook or it could be, you know, a database, what, 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 whatever the case is. But, you know, what I'll, I'll also go into some of these. Oh, we got a new caller. Hey, we have a raffle going. <laughs> One dollar. Um, no, so, you know, to also kind of go into more of um, some of these flows, you know, implicit flow is just typically for, you know, a SPA. So I put a SPA treatment just to give you an idea. But no, SPA actually stands for single page application. Um, but it's a good way of saying, like, look, you can't trust that client's browser with too much information. So again, it's not a good use case for if you're just doing just a browser transaction. Um, that, that's what implicit flow is typically used for if you're, if you're to be able to have some sort of way for someone to just verify who they are and then do some sort of token exchange. Um, the authorization code flow, which has been most of my focus of today, um, is really you know talking about that front channel versus a back channel. So it assumes that you know, the resource and the owner and the client are on separate devices. So you see this very commonly in modern stack um, scenarios where it's I have a front end. React-based application, and then a Java API layer on the back end. So being able to say, like, okay, here's where I would first sign in, but this single-page application is communicating these APIs for a specific experience. So I've logged into a car insurance application, and as after I've logged in, the immediate code operations then hit back an API structure. So you know, you see these a lot of times with like an API gateway, so MuleSoft or Apogee will provide more of like a context of more of the uh, scale and infrastructure behind providing APIs. But as far as like securing authorization, that's where 
more of an OIDC flow is, is in play. Does that make sense? What's the drawback? What's the drawback? Hmm. In what sense? Like meaning like is that if if you use this like it's your presentation, doom, I'm asking if, there's a doom <laughs> there's a doomsday device. <laughs> um, the drawback. So you know if you if you think about it, right, you, you just have to handle this this process very I mean the implementation of this is not just simple in, in most cases if you're trying to do this for yourselves. Um, so it's it's always good to just like see what's out there as far as just um, standards. So the caveats are like you know just make sure you're handling those two different types or you know if that's the scenario that's that's for you which is just like typical like modern stack being able to say that you know after I've logged in then I can hit all these APIs. You know being able to handle those client secrets like I was saying that's something that you need to be very very aware of because again if I get access to you got client ID secret, there's like basically no limit to what I can do. So you know, just handling that information is okay. I actually meant the explicit flow but what's the drawback of the explicit flow versus the implicit flow? The explicit flow? Um so implicit you mean implicit flow? Is that what you mean? No. You know what? It's a complicated question, never mind. It's just I'll ask it to break. Sure, yeah, we'll maybe maybe we'll take that off. So, you know, just giving you like sneak, sneak peeks more so than anything, sorry about that. Um, but uh, client credential flow is more of back of the house. So server to server communication, you have all these jobs that are teed up to then hit uh, you know, an API gateway, specifically there's no browser exchange. Being able to uh, provide that, that flow, again, very important to keep your keys uh, safe. And the other thing too is just like the device flow. So being able to have a TV authenticate, or I mean, who here uses Alexa right now, or a Google Home? Some some IoT device basically has the ability to have to have um, you know a way to authorize you are who you say you are, or that device is registered to you. So you typically would tie you know some sort of uh, QR code in that in that in that scenario, and then do more of a device flow where it's uh, behind the scenes. So it's important to note too with this device flow, you're still a person, you know, usually. That's you know, so correct. There's no there's no there's no uh, my opinion, this is my opinion. I don't I don't even want to rock that point. <laughs> is that um, there's no real solid flow that's secure for machine to machine and OAuth. Uh, it still always involves a person to make the decision. Yeah. Yeah, it still requires you, I mean, we've all experienced this if you've played around with IoT, it has to, actually has to have you like approve something, right? So it kind of goes back to that earlier model, which was Facebook, um, where it approved me to play Farmville, but it's like, I just got a Nest camera and I just installed it, and now I want to actually use that. And, and you have to know that context, for context that it's me, you have to actually approve that. What do you mean by back channel flow? Just want to make sure you're assuming the right thing. <coughs> yeah, back channel is, is basically not exposed to the client. So I, I do like an authorization start. start. Um, so you'd have to go back a few. But I, I would request to get a resource and give me back a code. I can't, you can't take that code and go get fetch yourself a token. You provide that code to a server. And then that server basically goes and fetches you a token on your behalf with that code. Right. So it's, it never exposes the ability for you to get the token. And the reason that's that's important is because if for some reason someone was sniffing your SSL traffic or or, in, introspect, or listening to your network traffic at all, being able to intercept that process and then get a token, if you open that door, then basically you get them into trouble there. So, any other questions? Um, you know, the other thing too is is basically kind of showing you a little bit of sneak peek of what a like job token would look like. So it gives you some context around like who's the issuer, what's the sub, the name, the audience that it's intended for, some ex expiration dates, IoT. So it's basically giving you some context around um, of that user, but um, most importantly, it's signed. So you know, if I did decide that. Okay, after I've given, been granted all these scopes and these profile permissions, wouldn't it be cool 
if I could just manipulate that token and then impersonate Christy when I was accessing her farm bill so that I could steal all of her crops and send all of her money back. So if I, if I did that, it would get blocked because of the way that we're signing it. So in a, in a, in a job token scenario, you're basically signing that, that whole payload and then it's not um, something that can be tampered with just based off of how the signature is. Does that make sense? So, um, you know, OIDC in a nutshell follows these basic patterns, right? Where discover, open ID provider, you know, give me the metadata of where all the different endpoints are, authorization, um, where all, where all the different endpoints for you to be able to, to provide or to go into a flow, and then um, perform the OAuth flow to obtain an ID and or access token. And then finally, you know, being able to just say, you know, with that JSON web token that comes back to verify that that's actually the authenticity of that token. And then finally, you know, being able to validate that that ID token um, is important. And then as well as getting all that user attributes with that access token. So it's like basically I've, I've now said I want to access said server or said API or said application. And then again, giving that, that context about who you are and then relaying that back to XYZ service. So that's basically my presentation for, the, for this one. Um, I do have another presentation after this, which is more DevOps centric. Um, but yeah, any additional questions? Yes. Okay, a couple. Sure. Uh, where does where do claims fit in? Mm. I forgot to mention that. So if you, after you basically scoped the user, you said all these different permissions, what you can do is you can say, after you've provided like phone number or you know whatever you define as your scopes or permissions, then you can then get claims that um, actually shove in information into that token. So that's the context that I'm talking about, which is more of like your rich profile information, your GUID, or, or any of that information that's just beyond just basic like, hey, this is your username. So it's all, all that. So claims will, will come into play by saying, you know, based off of these scopes, I claim that because you have phone, here's the, 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 the phone number as part of an attribute. Can store it. So think of scopes as more permissions and then claims as more of the attributes and then basically the marriage between the two things. Okay. And in, in the open OIDC? OIDC or Open Identity Connect, yep. Do refresh tokens come into play? Yeah, so you're given an access token and then uh, a refresh token. So if you were to revoke someone's access, you basically just go and fetch a new access token. Um, the refresh token is, is a user's way or a client's way to get another token. So after it expires, typically there's a lifetime that's set on that access token, um, but then you would use the refresh token to then fetch the appropriate, uh, the appropriate token. Ryan, in the protocol, when you're gathering this information mm -hmm. from the user, you know, unique ID, name, et cetera, registration information. I guess it's simply contracts and legal that says you're the provider. I'm trusting you not to share this with everybody in your network. Yeah, that, that, and that's the trust, right? You're saying when I give you access to post on my behalf, like on Facebook, a Facebook scenario again, you know, I'm trusting that you're handling that appropriately. But, you know, people miss you know, forget that to check that when you, you know, you are authorizing some other external service. Um, you forget to be able to be aware of like, hey, I don't want them to read my contact information or I don't want them to have my profile information. That, you have to be, you know, just diligent with that, but that's the contract, you, like you were saying, is the be, being able to, to trust that your service. But there's actually, nothing in the protocol that's gonna <coughs> safeguard a user from um, somebody who's right. taking that database. And I'm looking at Cambridge Analytics <laughs> yeah. scenario. No, no, no. no the, yeah, there's nothing really preventing someone from, I mean, like the standard doesn't call for you to, to actually care about security. That's typically up to, you know, if you're like a healthcare organization, you're going to be subject to HIPAA standards, so there's an expectation to it. If you're a rogue company, you know, 
or you know, not adhering to any specific standards, there's no real guarantee that that data is safeguarded. Yeah, unless that you know, said company or you can delegate all OIDC flows or, or use repositories to other companies. But you know, do you know if OpenID Connect is working on that at all? Or I know that the standard, at least they're continuing to contribute to it, um, but. Yeah, I, I don't know off the top of my head if that's a specific focus around just like guaranteeing like the safeguard of people's privacy, right? right. So to me, I, I believe that that should be a standard and, and we should all- What should be a standard? To be able to safeguard people's uh, privacy. I mean, I know there's obviously government laws, but you know, <laughs> there's nobody, if they're not subject to audits or, or any kind of scrutiny of them, there's no, no, no stopping someone from just selling you to someone else. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Yes. Um, you talked a little bit about the scenarios where this is one machine calling another machine. Yeah. And so if you have that happening, your client machine in that case is getting an access token that's allowing it to make calls. What if the client is really a cluster of multiple machines? Hmm. So you have multiple machines and potentially all firing off on, on different cylinders, right? Yeah, like if there's one access token and it gets you know, maybe a new one that all I have to know about at the yeah. same time, which obviously you'd rather not have to do all that complexity. No, and that, in that scenario, I've, I've seen that come up um, several times. And so making use of, of like, caching services that can be shared between them, um, that's also very good so that you're not, because usually like SaaS services will penalize you for just continuously fetching access or you know, access tokens all day, every day from like more of a server. Um, there's usually rate limits because yeah, I don't know if you're, if anybody's ever done this before, but like on um, Node, you can obviously do a lot of asynchronous fun stuff and you basically can hit, hit up against the rate limits. So, you know, the best way to do it is to somehow cache a token and then have it shared amongst all of those servers if that's possible. Sometimes that's not. So and, you know, maybe we can take some, some more. Do you have a specific use case that you were looking at all in mind? Well, um, I, not anymore because uh, <laughs> when we started, I wasn't doing so well. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we have to do it. If we get more than one server, we're going to have to put some sort of cache or shared memory in place just to handle this one token. Right, right. yeah. I know, but it's still, I mean, the trade-offs are, again, like, obviously you can be getting a new token every single time, but then you're going to get into performance of it, and it's just, because it's it, it's an appearing to the service provider, like, hey, you know, what's going on with your account? You're obviously just getting a zillion tokens, is, you know, is everything okay? Kind of, that's, that's like, the like, human way of kind of running Additional questions? Okay, thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you.